This week, Revisited takes us to the first African country to gain independence, and it really does have a unique history on the continent. In 2022, Liberia celebrated the bicentennial anniversary of its foundation, its so-called Year of Return, where freed American and Caribbean slaves, along with their descendants, returned to the African continent 200 years ago. The American Colonization Society financed the purchase of land for some 30,000 people who crossed the Atlantic to resettle on the West African coast. The city they founded, which became the country's capital, Monrovia, even named after the American president, James Monroe. Well, Liberia didn't officially become an independent republic until 1847, but the relative newcomers were by then the masters of the country, relegating the original indigenous population to the rank of second-class citizens. They only gained the right to vote a century later. Hostility between the descendants of the Americo-Liberians and the natives continued. In 1980, for the first time, an indigenous man, Samuel Doe, became president through, though, a coup d'etat. And in the following two decades, the country was torn apart by two bloody civil wars. More than 250,000 people killed. Peace returned in 2003. Despite the country's immense natural wealth, Liberia is among the 20 least developed countries in the world. It still holds a grip for many African Americans, fascinated by the complex history. And many have followed in the footsteps of their ancestors, visiting or even moving there. But for many Liberians, 200 years after its foundation, the country still bears the scars of civil war and crimes that have gone unpunished. Well, Sophie Lamotte and Sadia Manjo revisit Liberia for France 24. An unusual spirit fills the streets of Monrovia. Hope, peace and celebration. Thousands gather in the Samuel Doe Stadium, named after the first indigenous leader of the country, to celebrate the 200-year anniversary of the foundation of the oldest republic in Africa. A proud moment for President George Weah. As we today embark upon a journey for the next 200 years, let us think beyond this vast returning about the generation that will succeed us in the years to come. And the beautiful ones who are not yet born, how can we pave the way so that their future may be better than ours? 200 years of independence on a continent where most countries are only celebrating their 60th or 70th anniversary. It was founded by freed slaves who returned from the US to Africa after the abolition of slavery. It all started here on Providence Island where the first ships of freed slaves landed after sailing across the Atlantic to the shores of Liberia. Elizabeth's ancestors were amongst the more than 12 million people forced into the transatlantic slave trade. So I haven't been on the island for almost 30 years. Thousands of freed black Americans set foot here, ultimately setting the foundations for modern Liberia. So I can imagine that feeling that they may have had of trepidation and caution. And, and, but again, it, it's in the back, backdrop of hope. Hope for freedom, hope for making your own decisions for your life and all those things. For Elizabeth and many African Americans, Providence Island is a symbol of freedom, but also stirs some difficult memories of a racist history. It's, it's still difficult for people to even want to talk about it. You know, it, there's a sense of shame, there's a sense of, of shame. Because, because of being enslaved, 
of being less than, of, be, of being targeted, of being looked at as, as not being human. The love of liberty washes here, Liberia's motto, which hides a darker side of history. The repatriation of freed slaves was driven by the American Colonization Society, led by both slave owners and abolitionists, many of whom rejected the idea of cohabitation and assimilation. Fearing a revolution, they felt sending them back to Africa was a safer option. Those who survived the trip and integration in Liberia developed the country along the lines of American society at the time, starting with churches. One of the first settlers who arrived founded this church, the Providence Baptist Church, now led by Pastor Diggs. He wanted to be with people with the same skin pigmentation to help spread the gospel and to Christianize the people that were living in this place. That was part of the reason Liberia was funded, you know, to bring Christianity, to bring civilization to this part of the world. Religion, a major pillar of early Liberian society, but also of political life. It's in this building that the Declaration of Independence was signed, making Liberia the first independent nation on the continent. A liberation for some, but a darker page of history for others. For different groups to... And, you know, the struggle in the states, even when they came to this place, they met indigenous Liberians, okay, Africans. It was very, very difficult for them to connect. So even if we go back to the transformation from Providence Island to where we are, they used a gun to subdue the native to really surrender the land. In the early days of Liberia, settlers, Americo-Liberians, formed a political and economic elite. Many considered themselves more civilized than the indigenous populations. The elite minority ruled for 133 years. This building was their headquarters, overlooking Providence Island and the whole city. It's a hugely significant uh, structure that represents where the power was in the past. For activists like Hassan Bilici, it's important to deconstruct some of the myths surrounding Liberia's early history. Well, Liberia was not colonized by any government. Liberia was colonized by a non-governmental organization or NGO. The resentment against uh, uh, miracle Liberian's rule simmered under, was still under, and it boiled and came over in the 70s, culminating in the overthrow of the last American Liberian ruler, I mean president in Liberia in 1980, April 12th. 1980, a turning point in Liberian history. Samuel Doe, the first indigenous president, took power by force. For some, this was a symbolic revenge for the native population. In late 1989, Libyan-trained and American-educated Charles Taylor invaded Liberia with his group of rebels. This marked the beginning of 13 years of civil war leaving more than 250,000 people dead. Hassan Bilici has dedicated his life to documenting war crimes. He founded the Global Justice and Research Project to track down war criminals and hold them accountable. We have over five to 600 dossiers that we've documented. And we are currently working on several cases. He meets with Peter Sonia, representative of the Liberian Massacre Victims Association, and John Stewart, former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner. 
Their goal is to create a war crimes court in Liberia because to this day, no war criminal has ever faced the law in Liberia. In Liberia, impunity looms large. Corruption with impunity, of course, is accompanied by the abuse of human rights. All of this is the result of not only the war, but the result of social inequities that created conditions for war, injustice, dating back from the foundation of the republic up to now, where a group of citizens excluded the rest. This country is for every one of us. We need justice. Victim crying for justice on a daily basis. If we had justice in the country, Liberia would not think about nothing of corruption. But because there is no justice, people do things and just go scot free. Peter Sonsonia is an advocate for survivors of the St. Peter's Church massacre. In July 1990, the armed forces of Liberia opened fire on a Red Cross refugee camp set up in this church. This modest memorial to commemorate the 600 civilians killed, mostly from the Geo and Mano tribes. Some of them are buried under this basketball court. The building is still standing, but bears the ruins of war. Isolated in remote villages, some survivors can no longer walk or work. Rufus Cartsy is one of them. He had to play dead to make it out of this church alive. I was in Lutrin with Lily Bo for nearly a week. They enter with all speaking to anybody what they did, they started shooting. This bullet, they gone shot, it hit me right here. It came up so. Very heavy, helpless, I dropped. People rushing, people shooting, people dropping over each other. When they shot the other people, they fall on me. Their body was living well, they fall on me. Rufus Carsey survived, but 30 years later, he can barely walk, and he has to live with the trauma and grief of his two-year-old son's death. After killing everybody from the church, they end, they, some of them went upstairs to kill women and children. Because my son, my son, because baby people were downstairs. So the little boy that I'm talking about, he was with my, one of my, my sisters upstairs, wanted to escape through the window. They shot them until they were hanging until D. They were hanging to the window until D. Many victims like Rufus depend on activists like Peter and Sonia for their survival. For many historians, Liberia's modern history of war is a direct consequence of tensions between the Americo Liberians, also known as Congos, and the indigenous populations. But for this activist, what once opposed Americo Liberians and indigenous populations has now vanished. The Americo Liberian, when it came those days to settle here, you couldn't see. A typical Liberian, when there were government funds to easily work in this government, you will hear that it's the Congo, the Congo this, the Congo that, the Congo is working this place, do this. You check in our society now, you will not even know the difference between the Congo and the native. Everybody just like the same. For many historians, inequalities of the past have paved the way for corruption, violence and poverty. What started as the first independent nation on the continent, with the first black president and some of the most abundant resources on the planet, is now considered one of the poorest nations in the world. I want us to thank God for Liberia, that he's restoring Liberia. Uh, 
an unexpected trajectory for the small country, a beacon of democracy 200 years ago. Youths gather at the J.J. Roberts Monument, the first president of the nation, a symbol of peace and reconciliation, to pray for their country in the hope of a brighter future for Liberia. Sophie Lamott and Sergio Manjo revisiting Liberia for France 24. That's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website. That's at France24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.